presentation is by Dr. Eldrin uh, Lewis from Boston, uh, looking at evaluation of lixacinotide in uh, acute coronary syndromes. Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning. So um, these are my uh, declaration of interest. Um, I received uh, research funding from Sanofi, Amgen, and Novartis. And on behalf of the ELIXA uh, Executive Committee and investigators, it's a pleasure to talk with you this morning about the, uh, the ELIXA trial. The rationale for ELIXA was really founded on some of the early metabolic and cardiovascular findings, suggesting a potential cardiovascular benefit with the use of a GLP-1 receptor agonist, lixacinotide, um, in terms of improving endothelial functioning, uh, also improving blood pressure, uh, attenuating weight gain, and also uh, improving overall uh, weight, uh, sati early satiety. Based upon this, uh, we had uh, a rationale that was well-founded, and we wanted to look at uh, the use of uh, this GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, lixacinotide, and, and the two objectives were first uh, to determine whether or not there was uh, non-inferiority uh, with the use of this agent, um, and that would have to meet the FDA mandate of uh, the 95, 95th percent confidence interval of, uh, that does not exceed uh, 30 percent. Uh, but also, we wanted to look for superiority. We had 96 percent power to determine non-inferiority, and we had 90 percent power uh, to determine superiority with a 20 percent risk reduction estimate. Uh, the trial design was uh, targeting a higher risk population with diabetes mellitus, and all patients had a history of type 2 diabetes uh, with the presence of um, an acute coronary syndrome within 180 days. Um, it could either be, either be a myocardial infarction or it could be uh, unstable angina. Uh, we excluded patients who had a history of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Uh, patients with severe renal disease defined as a GFR of less than 30, and also patients uh, with uh, recent revascularization. Um, all of the patients who were eligible had a run-in period of about seven days in which they received uh, a volume-matched placebo uh, just to really understand if they can tolerate the injections. After the run-in phase, they were randomized to either 10 micrograms per day of lixacinotide uh, or they were randomized to uh, a volume-matched placebo. The investigators could increase the dose of the lixacinotide to a maximum dose of 20 micrograms per day. And also, uh, we insisted uh, that the investigators uh, were the primary uh, managers of the glucose. This was, in fact, not a glucose-lowering trial in that, uh, that the metabolic effects of lixacinotide uh, have already been uh, determined. So we, in fact, wanted to have a balance in the hemoglobin A1C between uh, the two arms, even though it was a double-blinded, uh, placebo-controlled trial. Um, in order to achieve the non-inferiority uh, power and also the superiority power, uh, we targeted 844 primary endpoints. Uh, these endpoints include uh, time to a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, and hospitalization for unstable angina. But there are also uh, several key secondary endpoints, and that includes heart failure hospitalization, which we think is a very important endpoint in this population, but also adding to the composite with coronary revascularization, heart failure hospitalization, and then also all-cause mortality. The mean follow-up was around 800 days, and the, the primary outcome uh, once again, being a combination of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or hospitalization for unstable angina, um, was a hazard ratio of 1.02. The 95th percent confidence interval is well below uh, that range uh, that determines safety with an upper bound limit of 1.17. There are 406 primary outcomes in the lixacinotide group compared to 399 in the placebo group. Now, this actually extends uh, the assessment, uh, looking at the primary outcome plus heart failure, uh, heart failure hospitalization alone, uh, 
uh, primary uh, plus heart failure hospitalization with coronary revascularization, and all-cause death. And as you can see, in all four, there's a consistent uh, neutrality and uh, cardiovascular safety. There is no superiority with hazard ratios that range from 0 0.94 to 1.00. Once again, heart failure hospitalization is a key secondary endpoint. And in order to understand the, the magnitude or the significance of this, we actually looked at the post heart failure hospitalization risk of mortality. Uh, and it turns out that for all patients who were hospitalized for heart failure, their risk for death thereafter was about ninefold higher compared to uh, those patients in Elixa who did not develop heart failure hospitalization. Another way to stratify risk is looking at patients with pre-existing chronic heart failure. And in Elixa, there are about 22% of patients who had a history of heart failure at the time of randomization. And as you would expect, their overall risk for heart failure hospitalization was higher uh, than those who did not carry a history of chronic heart failure at the time of randomization. However, uh, randomization to lixacinotide versus placebo uh, was not associated with uh, any uh, excess uh, risk. Uh, there was the same neutrality with the hazard ratio of 0 0.93. Um, and also in the patients uh, with, uh, without a history of heart failure at the time of randomization, there was also um, similar neutrality. So in summary, Elixa demonstrates the cardiovascular safety of lixacinotide as defined by the FDA guidance. Um, the 95% uh, confidence interval was well within the uh, 1.30 range that was uh, determined by the FDA. Um, however, there was not uh, superiority in reducing cardiovascular events in this high-risk population. Additional analyses uh, indicate safety with respect to the heart failure events as well as all-cause mortality. Uh, and in fact, if you, whether you look at patients with pre-existing heart failure or if you look at uh, patients uh, thereafter, uh, the overall uh, cardiovascular safety is present. Uh, and there was neutral effects uh, that were seen across the wide spectrum of heart failure risk, once again suggesting that this uh, particular agent is a, a safe way of reducing glucose. Thank you very much. So questions uh, regarding the ELIXA trial? Um, just one question. You, you said that it was not a glucose-lowering trial, um, but I'm just curious, they were all high-risk patients, so why was the comparator placebo and not some other glucose-lowering agent? Well, the, the reason is, once again, the uh, original studies have already demonstrated the ability of lixacinotide to lower, and I'm sorry, if you go wave your hand, I didn't see where you were. Oh, thank you very much. Um, you know, in the, uh, there are several studies that demonstrated the metabolic benefits of uh, lixacinotide, and the hemoglobin A1C uh, was lowered. Uh, so the purpose of this uh, was actually to uh, look at this population uh, in which the investigators could treat the, the patient's glucoses as best they can to try to con control it. In fact, as you look through the, uh, the follow-up, uh, the patients randomized to placebo ended up taking more uh, medicines for glucose lowering uh, than the patients randomized to lixacinotide. Um, despite this, uh, the net hemoglobin A1C was lower in the lixacinotide group. Another way to help frame that for you clinically, uh, and many of you may know this, is that over the years there have been a number of trials that have shown that some treatments for glucose may increase cardiovascular risk. So his comparing this with placebo is actually very informative. There was a question right here, this lady. Hi, Dr. Lewis. Could you just um, tease out for me what's actually new here over and above what you presented at the American Diabetes Association, please? Yes. Uh, so several things. One is we extended um, our analysis in the patients with heart failure. Uh, we wanted to look at this high-risk population, and as you could see, their event rates were much greater uh, than those uh, in patients with, uh, without chronic heart failure. In fact, we, uh, I didn't show the slides for this press conference, but we'll show it later. Um, we looked at uh, 
other events too. So if you look at the primary outcome, um, all-cause mortality and other effects, uh, the history of chronic heart failure uh, prior to randomization was associated with excess uh, risk of those events. And in that particularly high-risk population with heart failure, uh, there was no additional, there was no, um, uh, uh, there was no concern in terms of um, the use of lixacinotide. You had a similar neutral effect. So we can extend uh, this beyond just the acute coronary syndrome population, but uh, one of the highest risk populations with acute coronary syndrome with heart failure. In addition, we looked at the hazard ratio uh, after heart failure hospitalization, which demonstrated um, a hazard ratio of 9.3 um, of all-cause mortality. And once again, that suggests that uh, these heart failure hospitalization events are very important, despite it's not being a part of the primary uh, outcome. And then finally, we looked at uh, patients stratified by BNP quartiles. Uh, once again, as a way of assessing risk among this uh, high-risk acute coronary syndrome uh, trial. And uh, as the quartiles increased, the overall risk um, increased in all comers. However, there was a similar neutral um, effect uh, with lexicinotide. Um, Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So just remind me about the benefits of glucose lowering if you don't get any cardiac benefits from it? Yes. Uh, the, and a lot of this is certainly best answered by diabetologists and endocrinologists, but, uh, but certainly the microvascular um, effects um, have been uh, consistently shown to be benefited by uh, glucose lowering. Uh, that includes uh, potential reduction in retinopathy, but also there's a potential reduction in proteinuria, which is an important prognostic factor, and the progression to um, chronic kidney disease. Uh, because of those microvascular benefits and also non-cardiovascular benefits, glucose lowering is, um, is certainly still targeted. Does that change the um, value in older patients where they're not going to live long enough to worry about um, the, the microvascular complications? I mean, are we, uh, is tight glucose control less important with these kind of findings in older patients? Uh, certainly I can't, um, I can't be informed by this trial in terms of uh, addressing that question. I think that's an, a very important safety uh, question for a management of all patients, including diabetes. Um, in order to really answer that, you need to do a dedicated trial looking at uh, older patients, potentially the uh, octogenarians, um, and looking at outcomes uh, with uh, glucose lowering. We know that in general glucose lowering is effective. Uh, we know that strict glucose lowering achieving lower targets can be associated with, um, with adverse events in some populations, and um, therefore um, one could extend this and it will be an interesting study to consider. Uh, I think uh, we have to move uh, to the next presentation.